Hello there, fellow explorer. The Vintage Pilot School podcast, episode three, is ready for departure, coming to you all the way from Regena, Valencia this time. I will be answering some questions from loyal listeners, and you will find out about my futile attempts to rationalize my carbon footprint and how I can sleep at night knowing that every hour of flying is costing me more than a day's wages. Time for a jingle. You might be pleased to hear that I'm quite happy for two reasons. One, I no longer have to record these episodes from within my crammed, very hot wardrobe in Ghent, but instead I have a slightly larger, equally acoustics unfriendly, and even hotter wardrobe in Regena. Fortunately, with plenty of space to breathe and no moths flying around this time. In the background, you might hear the occasional roaring of engines, for which I apologise in advance, but that is because the house I'm staying at is in fact located very close by the airfield, so we have plenty of aerial manoeuvring activities taking place some 3,000 feet above our heads. And reason number two, I am now officially enrolled as a flight school student indeed. Not quite a pilot yet at the time of recording, though. Um, Because of some low clouds and a few hiccups in the planning, I'm still waiting for my true aerial baptism, or as Nigel Tanger would have put it, a joyride flight. But at least the theory is going very well, and I will soon be able to report back with more stories from the air. But first, let me tell you how I got here, before we drift off into the realm of flying aeroplanes. In the previous episode, we travelled through space and time with a trip to Kiev, where I visited the Aviation Museum and also admired some of the wonders of Soviet aeroplane engineering. I have to admit, I didn't really get round to doing much studying in the week leading up to my departure from Ghent, as I was quite preoccupied with packing lots of t-shirts and swim shorts. After I decided what unnecessary items to discard from my bags, I soon found myself at the gate of Brussels Airport, spying on middle-aged Belgian people who were all amped up about their upcoming city breaks. Now, the typical Belgian 40-something traveller usually comes in a package deal of two, consisting of a male and a female half, and they tend to be very well equipped with Lonely Planet travel guides, credit card insurance, 100 euros of cash stashed away in a sock or a secret compartment of their rucksack, and sometimes, if you look very, very closely, you can even spot the tattoo with emergency contact details on their forearms, just in case. And I'm sure that that is exactly the type of traveller that the council of a city like Valencia is more than happy to welcome in its chaotic centre. So people who like to spend decent amounts of money on good food, people who don't mind waiting in line for a museum, and most of all, the Belgians are always polite, and they at least make an attempt to order their drinks in Spanish and sometimes even in Catalan. I've never actually heard someone say that Belgians are bad hotel guests, so we'll proudly take that medal. May we have your attention while we point out some of the safety features on this Boeing 737-800 aircraft. From what I've been able to tell during my brief time here so far, it seems to me like Spain is slowly recovering from the economic crisis that struck so ruthlessly a decade ago. The uh, people that I speak with are no longer so radically pessimistic, and at least there are actual jobs available, though not always as well paid as they should be, or in uh, future-driven sectors. Of course, unemployment remains very high in Spain, second only to Greece within the EU region, and many recent university graduates still try their luck abroad, and rightfully so. The EU country with the lowest unemployment rate at this very moment is actually the Czech Republic, uh, for a number of reasons. I've added a link to the background article on just that to the blog post that goes with this podcast. On a lighter note, it always strikes me how much the weather influences my mood, so hot and sunny days just give even the most ordinary days that little extra shine. And it doesn't matter that everybody likes to have a siesta between two and five and just lounges around for a while, because that's exactly what I feel like doing too, and it's perfectly acceptable here. 
So here I am in that small remote town located very close to the airfield where I'm learning to fly. Um, I think we'll talk about Valencia at a later date because I've only had the chance to visit very briefly so far, but I can already tell it's definitely the kind of place with enough entertaining things to keep you going for a few days. It's the third largest city in Spain after all, with close to a million inhabitants. I've been getting quite a few questions from podcast listeners, and there are two very intelligent ones that I would like to elaborate on. The first one comes from a Belgian listener who prefers to remain anonymous, so for once I will shed my coat of shame for a moment and try to put on a Belgian accent. Apologies in advance, it only lasts for a few seconds. Hey Thomas, what do you think about your carbon footprint when you fly a plane? Don't you feel guilty about wasting the environment every time you have lessons? Do you compensate by planting trees at home? Groetjes. Well, thank you very much, anonymous fan. Very helpful, but also a very justified comment to make, of course. Now, I could easily dismiss this one with a derisive snort and say that we are headed for climate disaster anyway, and there's no point in trying to preserve anything on this planet, but that's not really the right spirit to ensure the survival of our species. By default, each and every person who lives in Western Europe is a one-man attack on our environment. The clothes we wear, the food we eat, even if you think you're trying to be eco-friendly, you probably aren't. And I'm no stranger to that myself either. I love those juicy apples from New Zealand and I like my chocolate very, very dark. Both quite impactful things already. That's no excuse to be completely oblivious, of course, and I believe that there are a number of ways you can at least go from being an outrageous giant when it comes to ecological footprints to a slightly more normal-sized person. So that's why I myself made the very conscious decision to go without a car of my own for as long as I can, and uh, actually I'm still managing just fine at 26. Another thing is vegetarian eating habits. I'm not quite there yet myself, but I'm very glad to see that it's now perfectly normal to go meatless for at least a few days a week, even if you're not such an eco-warrior. And, of course, where you live also matters. Um, My city life, for example, is by definition a lot more sensible from a perspective of urban planning. A higher density population implies more space for nature and also better use of public services. All of these factors go quite far, actually. Um, In in the blog, I've also added a link to a recent BBC podcast hosted by uh, Tim Harford that suggests the single most impactful thing we could do is to have fewer children. Something to think about. Now, I'm very well aware that the aviation industry is quite notorious for its rather suboptimal carbon footprint, and flying small planes for a hobby makes very little sense if you think about it for a moment. They don't go very far, they aren't very fast, and most of their trips aren't very functional either. To give you a rough idea, a typical single-engine aircraft like a Piper Warrior or a Cessna might use roughly 30 to 35 litres of aviation fuel on a one-hour flight, covering perhaps 200 kilometres of distance in the process. And if you compare that to a modern-day car, you might only need 5 litres for 100 kilometres, so three times less. Now, aviation gasoline is a bit different in consistency from the uh, petrol that you use to fill up your car, but the emission figures are actually not quite as far apart as you might think. The largest difference, however, lies in the way hobby pilots use their planes compared to cars. Flying as a hobby is very, very expensive. You should count on at least 150 euros for an hour's worth of flying. So every minute spent in the air will cost you a cappuccino at a nice cafe, basically. So even the most avid of hobby pilots don't rack up the hours like your average car commuting person does. And I try to keep a clear conscience by thinking that even if I cleared my bank account completely and went flying every day, I wouldn't be able to get close to the emissions of someone who was stuck in traffic on their way to work from Monday through Friday. A second question, and this is one I get very, very often, is how I manage to afford all this, and then usually with a follow-up question, why I don't spend all this money on something more sensible. There is some very interesting literature available about buying material things versus buying experiences. Most of the research suggests that past a certain income level, of course, there is actually more point in buying, for example, gifts for other people or buying experiences for yourself because it increases happiness levels more than yet another jumper in the wardrobe or a new phone. 
In addition, people tend to underestimate the power of the so-called comfort principle. So the more time you spend on something, the more money you should allocate to it. And that's exactly the reason why I don't mind having a very expensive laptop. But on the other hand, my road bike is quite terrible. If, if I ever need a bike on race day, I can always rent one. And the same goes for a car, really. A year or two ago, I actually stumbled upon a blog about someone who had rationalised this line of thinking to the extreme. So this person had created a formula that took into account his personal preferences, the comfort principle, and also the novelty factor of certain items, because new things wear off quite quickly, uh, like, a, like a very fancy car compared to a really bad one. And um, to him, it was very clear that the best purchases were small treats, like expensive bath soap, a magazine, or even going to the theatre. And for me personally, I also try to uh, make that calculation and it's usually travelling that does the trick for me. Or more precisely, being away and putting myself in a position to learn something new and get a new perspective on things. I know that sounds a little bit blasé, uh, but it actually works quite fine for me. And that is exactly why such a big investment on a career break makes perfect sense to me, more than a new car or a swimming pool in the garden ever could. For some reason, I cannot seem to find that particular blog anywhere on the internet anymore, and I can no longer recall the name of the person behind the happiness points calculation, so please do let me know if uh, this rings a bell with you. Real stop. Roger, we'll stop, Discovery. Welcome back. A great ending to the new beginning. I will be spending the next few days in the air or on the ground learning about how to behave in the air, so I think this will do for episode number three. Next week, I'll be back with a more light-hearted episode about the heart of the matter, and that is flying. If you happen to have particularly liked or disliked this episode, please do let me know and make sure to subscribe to the Facebook page and to the Spotify and iTunes streams and share it with your friends, family, housemates or your pet hamster. For now, goodbye. <laughs>